Welcome everybody. I have again with me Jay Smith and we're going to have a series of uh, mini discussions on two topics mainly and broadly. One of them will be the persecution of Christians globally and the other will be the preservation of the Quran. So bearing that in mind, um, I'd like to welcome Jay and really just kind of get into my first topic of conversation, which is the persecution of Christians globally. So I wanted to run through some figures which I find horrific, uh, sickening, I think is the only word, and I, I can feel my blood boiling as I'm about to read them out because I've spent a couple of hours praying about it and trying to remove this feeling of disgust and uh, guilt, actually, for not having known specifically the details before and uh, anger at my own government for not making these things clear. So... Uh, globally, one in nine Christians suffer for the profession of their faith. So confessing their faith means that they suffer. And um, that's up. That was the 2019 figure. And that's up from one in 12 only, only in uh, 2018. There were also 4,136 deaths of Christians, uh, killings, not just obviously natural causes. And that's only, that's not around the globe, that's only in the top 50 countries for persecution. And that was in 2018. So I have a, a good idea that that number has gone up. Uh, one case I want to um, focus on, although I don't know all of the details, I just want to mention it in passing because I'm going to make some more videos, is that of uh, a 14 year old girl in Lahore, Pakistan. And her name is Myra Shabazz. And I apologize for the pronunciation but that's not the important part. She's 14 years old. Um, she's been kidnapped, forced into an Islamic marriage. Not all Christian persecution is Islamic, but this case unfortunately is. Her mother, I mean, I'm the mother of a girl who's older than Myra, and her mother is beside herself with grief. And I mean that in a literal sense, she's had a heart attack during the court proceedings because the man has been taken to court. And what he's claiming is that she, is in fact 19 years old at the time of the kidnap. So I'm feeling quite sick, so I'm gonna hand over to Jay for just some thoughts on, I mean, I know Jay that you're from, uh, originally from India, is that right? Or born That's in correct, India? Yeah, yeah so, as, so India is in the top uh, 50 lists also of uh, countries which most vociferously persecute Christians. So I just wondered, why, yeah. don't, why doesn't anybody know about it? I guess. And what it's we do about the prayer. This has been coming out this just week, these statistics that are from 2019. So you're just reading about them now. This is fascinating because the same week that this is coming out and made public, none of the major channels here in America, CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, Fox, none of them have uh, said anything, not one thing about these statistics, mm -hmm. which is fascinating because the entire narrative today is all about George Floyd and all about the Black Lives Matters and all about these people being who have been killed by police. That has taken over the narrative. Now, I understand this is an election year, so that may have something to do for it. But I think this is symptomatic of every year. We don't see these kind of statistics except on secondary and third uh, rung media channels and oh, uh, the Christians have been asking for some type of response to this. Christians all around the world. I, this is nothing new for me, Kay. As long as I've been working in Islam for 40 years, this, these are the kind of statistics. It's getting worse. I don't remember this number, these kind of numbers, 4,000 or one in nine. One in nine, that is an enormous amount. That means more than a tenth of, of our uh, Christians are being killed and persecuted around the globe in just the top 15 mm -hmm. countries where this is the case. Now, to be fair, not all of them are by Muslims. In India, yeah. I would imagine the majority of them would be Hindus that are doing the persecution. Having come from India, that is the case. Yeah. But it stands to, it's, it's, to me, it's a shocking. It's, I'm as shocked as you are. And as you get into each one of these stories, like the one from Nigeria that you just recounted to me personally, it, it makes you angry. I can see why you're angry. And I think those of us who have been in part of this uh, this uh, well, this work, this ministry of engaging with Islam publicly, who have also seen the damage that Islam has done to Christians when they become Christians, the apostates. Yeah. And almost all of our apostates have to live with fear in their lives. 
you have to ask why is it that Islam particularly, I'm not saying it's only Islam, but t- Islam particularly persecutes Christians. And the answer really is right here. It always comes back to this book. It really comes back to this book, okay? And you just have to read the verses that are in this book that no one wants to talk about. Yeah. Chapter 8, verse 39. Slay the unbeliever until there is no more fitna, there is no more unbelief in the land. Now, how many times have I had to read this and say this? Cut off the heads of the unbelievers. Chapter 47, verse 4. Slay the unbelievers, besiege them, lay an ambush for them. Chapter 9, verse 5. Make war on the people of the book. There it is, on the people of the book. That's us. Make war on the Christians. Chapter 9, verse 29. And it goes on and on and on. There's so many of these verses. No one wants to deal with these verses. Oh, the liberal Muslims say, well, that's for the 7th century. We leave it in the 7th century. If it was for the 7th century, then why is it not say so in the Quran? These are statements for everyone, everywhere, at any time. So then you can understand why this terrible case that's just happened with the Boko Haram in just the last day. What? How many were killed by, by them just in the last day? That's, um, that did get into the news, but not into the major news, not into the network news. That had to be sent to me by someone in private who got it from one of their local news. And it's these kind of statistics that are coming out of Muslim countries where when they read this book, and remember, this is the word of God. This is eternal. This has, cannot be critiqued. This is not of human hands. This has always existed on those eternal tablets, according to chapter 85 and 22. In the Quran, it says that, and this is the Quran that has been preserved, chapter 15, verse 9. If that is the case, Kate, can you then understand if you are a Muslim, put yourself in their shoes, and you believe this is this is not to be questioned, this is to be followed, this is your sole authority modeled by Muhammad. And take a look and see what Muhammad did when he actually applied this book. Look and see what he did to the Jews there in Medina in 624, 625, and 627. You know the stories. If that is the case, and that's your model, and this is your authority, then I'm not surprised that we're seeing this. But who's standing up against it? Who is actually saying it? Except for you and a few others, nobody is even decrying it or actually speaking up in public about it. I'd like that's to, um, sorry, I'd like to just raise a couple of points while they're in my mind, because uh, rather sillily, I haven't got a pen. So with the Black Lives Matter, um, I'm not... At this time, I'm not going to get into that, except to say that the stories I'm going to recount for you in a moment, and they're only like within the last month, um, they are black lives, black mm-hmm. Christian lives that are being ended. And unfortunately, they're by uh, black Muslims. It's in Africa. Nigeria, like I said, is number 12 at the moment in the top 50. And if you, I mean, I'll be the first to admit, North Korea is number one. It has been for 18 years. It's not. Um, Islamic persecution there. I I care little who is doing the persecuting. The body of Christ is suffering. My brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters, people's children, people's siblings are being abducted, set on fire, murdered, raped. Um, So before I just get really angry, I'm going to jump into what I would say actually is bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. It's such a is such the polar opposite of fight the unbeliever, kill them where you find them, uh, fight until there are no more unbelievers. It is prescribed for you to fight, even if you don't want to fight, Allah knows best. It's so polar opposite that for Allah to then say, he is the Yahweh, my Yahweh, your Yahweh of the Bible, is pretty preposterous. Um, So Let's do a comparison right here. here. I read you the verses that are in this one here, and you asked what... Black, whenever it's black on black, you're not. It's not newsworthy. Yeah. You won't get anybody berating or bringing this out as a newsworthy item. And unfortunately, American news and our European news is much more focused on what's happening in America and what's happening in Europe. So that's understandable. I'm not saying that that would, there should be. This should be front and center. But what I'm asking is why is no one's talking about this? Now let's go back to these two books. These are the two books that I always go to to find out how I'm to act, how I'm to live, and how I'm to uh, respond. When you look at these two books, I've already given you verse after verse. There, I mean, there's so many. I could give you about 150 verses that are violent in this book. I can't find one verse that said they're to have peace or to there to be peaceful with us Christians. I've not been able to find one verse in the Quran that says anything near that. I think I know of now, something that alludes. Let's, let's go and ask the same person of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Let's run that over. And in some ways, this will respond to what you have just been saying. In the Bible, we have in Matthew 10, where Christ says, if you go in my name, 
expect to be hated, expect to be persecuted, expect to be jailed, expect to be flogged, and expect to be killed. That is the, he is, he is there with the 12 disciples, and he's sending them out as lamb before wolves. That's the commissioning of the 12 disciples. Okay, that's your commissioning. That's my commissioning. Mm -hmm. But that's for those of us who take the gospel and actually go and use it in a public context. That's what we should expect. Yeah. This is not for people who have never said anything, who have never, ever made a pronouncement. And these who are being killed, the ones who are being killed, are those who are being massacred. Yeah. The injunction that we should expect this are for those of us who are in ministry, those of us who are taking the word and actually going to the diaspora, going to the Gentiles, as Paul was. And that's what Paul had. In fact, all the disciples were all hated and persecuted. They were all killed, except for John. And Paul himself also was killed. So I can understand in the Bible, we are to do this. We are expected to do this. In fact, it says in that same chapter, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, yes. which means to set father against son and mother against daughter. In other words, Christ was, was getting us ready. We are going to be killed for this. And it's going to be from your own family. It's going to be from your father and your mother. Don't be surprised when this happens, what he is saying. Mm -hmm. And then he ends by saying, he who's not willing to bear my cross is not worthy to be my disciple. So in case, in, I, and, and I expect this, I understand it, I am, I'm aware of the fact that Christ promised that this would happen to us, but this is not on this scale and not on this, at this level with, uh, with Christians who have not set a peep about their faith. They're being killed. These girls who are being raped and killed in Nigeria, what was their crime? Uh, even that, is that a crime? Well, so it's fascinating to me that, that we're seeing this played out in our own lives here in the 21st century, and no one wants to talk about this elephant in the room. This is an elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. I would say it's more than an elephant in the room. It's um, pictures of open graves with uh, 20 to 30 charred and non-burnt um, bloodied corpses, uh, some of them dismembered, some of them not. I would say that it's the case of 22 year old, so that's very young, just starting out in life. And her name was Vera Uela Muzua. And again, I apologize uh, for the uh, pronunciation, but she was a microbiology student and using her church to study in the peaceful time when there was no congregation. And just this month, um, not even just a little over a week ago, she was uh, raped, found in a pool of blood, and died some days later. Uh, also, um, you mentioned Boko Haram. I'd like to pray desperately for those people. They are absolutely misguided and possessed by something that is so far from Christ and his love and forgiveness that God can save to the uttermost, and I hope, I pray for those people. I really pray that they're delivered from that delusion that they're under. Um, but this really touched me. The man was a reverend. His name was Lawan Andimi, and he was abducted. And in his hostage video, he still preached the gospel. He still spoke of forgiveness and patience and peace um, and kindness. And he, he basically said, you know, I'm asking for the state governor to secure my release. But if it doesn't happen for his family, not to worry. And it's literally tear inducing he's got a piece about him that is I'm sure not not from his own heart at that you know he's got the big flag next to him and he's being forced into saying how well they're treating him which I'm guessing is not the case um and the final one I guess it's but so when I I don't use google but when I engine searched it um, I put in these words and you can try it yourself Christian pastor killed in Nigeria and I got 10,800,000 search results and Nigeria, even though it's only only number 12 in the top 50, it's actually the most likely place for you to be killed for confessing Christ. So even though North Korea has around 300,000 Christians and 50,000 of those uh, poor souls are in internment camps, um, in Nigeria you are most likely to be killed for confessing Christ, which I just think is so very sad. Um, so the last one was another pastor. Emmanuel Vilea and his pregnant wife, Juliana. This, they left eight children orphaned, apart from the child that was also murdered uh, in the womb of Juliana. And this was 11 days ago. So I dread to think if I'd have looked at May, April, March, February, and January, but 
I don't think the rate has increased greatly, apart from, you know, globally, as we say in the top 50, going from uh, one in uh, nine to one, from one in 12 to one in nine, I think it's a pretty steady torrent of um, rapes, murders, and, you know, just only God knows, actually. And I think in terms of the mainstream, it doesn't fit the narrative of the peaceful religion. But actually, one other thing. In 2016, the British Home Office, that, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying it, and, and it's true, they denied an Iranian um, apostate from Islam, a convert to Christianity, um, said they would like to claim asylum in Britain, and the actual Home Office, I'd love to know the worker who did this, the civil servant, because servant is the key word, they wrote back and they quoted six or so verses from the Old Testament to contest the applicant's um, insistence that Christianity was a religion of peace. So our vaguely um, state-ordained religion, the religion that the Queen of England is the defender of, um, we actually argued against that being a peaceful religion by cherry-picking verses from the Old Testament, which, unlike the Quran, are not eternal commands. Obviously, the Amicalites, the Midianites, they are no longer here. They don't need to be wiped from the face of the earth. Hey, isn't anymore. that interesting? And I've heard about this case that yeah. here is a poor soul who is trying to get into England because of the persecution in his background. And the person who is questioning him, it's obviously a Muslim who's questioning him, in order to pass this test to gain entry into a Western country like England, he had to pass a test that how many, uh, even Christians can even answer that test. Mm -hmm. How do you explain these, this violence in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and Joshua mm -hmm. chapter 6? You and I know how to defend that. But somebody who's just coming under persecution, who's coming out of persecution, oh. and they are suddenly supposed to defend that as if there's a test for Christians, but there's not one for Muslims? No, Has there it, ever been a, any test for Muslims coming into England? Is there any test about how they can defend the violence in their Quran? As, as, that to me is a nasty, but that would be all over the news if that were ever uncovered. And yet here, we've been saying it since 2016. This is what some, not all, but some Christians have to go through just to get into the UK. Mm. A test on the violence in the Old Testament and how you explain it. Well, the thing is, the case where, of, where, the, where has Britain gone wrong in this? And why are they allowing men like that to be in their, their office, who are in their home office, who are putting these tests together? Obviously, there is a bias here. Obviously, this is an Islamic bias. And obviously, there's a mole in the, in the system. And that's why in the West, that, would, that has not yet been put on to national news. Again, that's only in secondary news. We, uh, some, some, people, some of us know who that person was. We know what they had to go through. And there, this is not just a one-off case. This has been, uh, I can give you like three or four people who this has happened to. And I think to me, this is, de this is decrying the system and absolutely suggesting that we as Christians have a double standard enforced and imposed upon us that no one else has. And I think, I wonder why, if really UK has a, a Judeo-Christian in background, why in the world are we putting these people through that kind of trust just to get into our, uh, into our borders? The thing is, we've had a long and varied and rich history as the result of immigration. I think all Brits would agree on that. We had uh, the Huguenots uh, and maybe the 17th century, my history may be off. We had an influx of Jewish people in London. We then had uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi people, even West Indian people. Um, I don't, well, th obviously there are people who decry that in and of itself, but we, um, well, we are completely commercially open <laughs> to business, as it were. We welcome people who are hardworking, who are educated or want to better themselves, um, unless, it seems, they um, confess their, their faith in, and it's not the state-sponsored, not the state-ordained, but the sponsored, religion that is deemed to be persecuted. So without being too political, I don't okay. believe in Islamophobia because I don't have a phobia. I um, have a mind, which not if I listen to Islam, I've only got 50%, but I've got eyes. I can read the Quran, whether it's in English or not. I've got Arabic speaking friends who are able to verify for me what I'm reading. Um, we are happy to take back jihadis who have left our shores, um, we are happy to pay for their constant around-the-clock protection. In the case of Asia Bibi, so Pakistan is now deemed number five in the world. So it's only four short steps behind North Korea um, in terms of the persecution of Christians. 
Um, that lady, everybody should know the case by now, spent eight years on death row for being accused of uh, denigrating or disrespecting Mohammed, a man who's long dead with all due respect. Um, and now her brother-in-law has had his throat slashed. Our, so my prime minister at the time said we couldn't guarantee the lady's safety. I mean, to be quite frank, she could have worn a niqab and blended right in in some parts of Britain anyway. Nobody would have known who she was particularly. So she and her husband are now safe, but the rest of her family, also her legal team, have been threatened. There have been attempts on their life. The judge who tried the case, it's absolute hysteria. And yeah, um, until she was making applications for asylum, we didn't really hear anything about it. Not that she's British, that's fair enough, but still she's a Christian. So whereas I don't actually expect my government to inform me of this, surely church leaders, I mean, the Church of England has become, unfortunately, I pray for them, ineffectual to the point of it's a nonsense now. And I don't mean that about the believers, I just mean the hierarchy. That there have been uh, Christian converts, apostates from Islam in the north of England, They've literally undergone years of being terrorized for their apostasy. And when they've approached church leaders, they've been told, uh, we can't help you. And I just find it, I know I'm ranting, but I can't wait actually to get into this series of videos that I'm going to do. And at the same time, I'm finding it difficult to give thanks in all there things. So many, there are so many of these type of examples. We could go on all day giving examples. Yeah. Um, I find it fascinating when the Christchurch massacre happened, the entire world heard about it. The entire world shut down. The entire media spent days and days only focusing on that one massacre, as horrendous as it was. Seven days later, in fact, the very next day, there was a massacre in Nigeria of much larger proportion. Around 200 were killed. Not one, not one paragraph on any major media. And to me, I was, the penny dropped at that time. We don't care uh, if it's black on black. If black people are being killed or if Africans are being killed, sorry, they're, they're, to me, to us, we just don't really care anymore. And yet when uh, some Pakistanis and Indians and Bangladeshis were killed there in Christchurch, that immediately took the entire world news, everybody. I mean, even the royalty went to visit it and almost every news agency decried it, which they should have done. But where is the reciprocity? Where is the decriment when it happens in Nigeria? Why is it black lives don't matter in Nigeria, but they do in New Zealand? Yeah. And that's, and only when it's at the hands of Christians do they matter, but they doesn't matter when it's at the hand of other blacks. Now, I, 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 we, we can go on with this. I think we need to bring this I to don't, I think I, I think I'd be happy. I think, I think this is something we need to have. Those of you who are watching this, what are you doing about this? How many of you are standing up and asking to for the news agent, agencies or for our politicians to also take into account what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in Ethiopia, all over Africa, what's happening when real black lives do matter? And these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're not criminals. I would add that they're, they've committed no crime. They're not being restrained or, um, you know, attempted to be detained by the police. They're, they're, no. they're completely innocent of any um, any wrongdoing, most probably. Yeah. No, so. And I would love to see more people in the church stand up, and more people in the media stand up, and more and more, many more of our politicians stand up, and start saying there needs to be justice done. And we have we are we are so navel looking that we have forgotten that there's an awful lot of persecution happening all around us. But those lives do matter. Yeah, for sure. Right. With that, I think we'll end this segment. Uh, also, just take a breath and try and uh, yeah. I think the one thing I would say is the the absolute best weapon that any Christian has who is watching is prayer. That should be your first port of call. But I think that to specifically pray for certain peoples is very important because it's easy enough to pray for, I don't know, generically for everybody who's in pain or everybody who's afraid or everybody, you know, all of that. That's, that's still legitimate. God knows your heart. But if we can pray for specifically, potentially, you know, Nigerian Christians or those who minister in Nigeria because they're more um, targeted than other Christians, you know, it's those kind of things that focuses your mind and then I'm sure God will reveal to you ways, other ways in which you can make a difference, even if it's just donating to a to a legitimate Christian charity who 
you know, something along those lines. So I, actually, I'll do some research on that as well, and I'll come back to everybody with that, how you can support them. CLM, Christian Lives Matter too. Yes. For sure. Okay. No what the colour. Yeah. God bless you. God it's bless you too. Okay. All right. Take care.